you know, let me begin, since I'm part of the family, t by objecting to the title of this session. Why are we calling it poly crisis? What does this fancy term mean? <laughs> it's a, it's, yeah, there are multiple crises. Why, but why don't we just call it what it is, capitalism, right? It is the nature of workings of global capitalism with all of the attendant geopolitical and other things that have resulted in the multiple crises that we are facing today. And we could see them all coming, and many people did see them coming. The fact that they've come together is also not unexpected. So, you know, in a way, uh, the term polycrisis, which is increasingly used by a lot of European thinkers, is, a, is kind of, you know, making it something like a deus ex machina, something outside the system, which has happened to us. It isn't. It is very much, as Shalmali was suggesting in the beginning, something that has been created by particular processes of global capitalism over the last three decades especially, really since the early 1990s. Um, and so how are they manifesting? What are these specific things that are showing up in this? And what can multilateralism do about it? What has it done about it? So again, punchline first, multilateralism has failed on this one. Okay, it's fairly clear, we all know that. But I will come back to how exactly it's failed. So let's think of the different crises we face. The ecological crisis. Uh, I know that uh, Raghu is going to talk a lot more about that. Uh, but, and of course, the particular politics of dealing with it right now. <coughs> but it is something that was inevitable, given the strategies of development, given the obsession with growth at all costs, and for developing countries, export-led growth at all costs without regard to the environmental implications, without regard to the broader climate and planet conditions. So uh, it was predictable, and it has come to a head. And of course, it's come to a head much faster than anyone has anticipated. Um, in, in our board, we have been meeting with some IPCC members who are truly terrifying, who are telling us that, frankly, now that the poles are met melting at the rate they are, all bets are off. None of our predictions is valid. We really cannot tell you what is next because it's so off the charts. In, in other words, I don't want to scare you too much, but it is really, really bad in terms of what is happening to the planet and, and all the attendant implications. Mm. We also know that it was a deeply resource-intensive pattern of growth. Uh, Okay, again, I shouldn't use the word resource because you know we tend to use everything in nature as just a resource for us, but let's call it a material intensive pattern of growth. There was a lot of talk about how the IT revolution and services, etc., is going to transform the nature of economic activity, so we won't need so much material input. That hasn't been the case. We have been multiplying material input endlessly. And weirdly, the more international organizations and people everywhere start talking about something, the worse it gets. I'm, I'm thinking of plastics, for example. You know, there was a lot of move to control plastics. China actually led the way by stopping the import of plastics for you know, treatment and so on. And there is an international plastics treaty being negotiated right now. Yet the extent of plastic waste has continued to expand even at even higher rates than before. And uh, the trade in plastics has shifted direction. Yes, less going to China, more going to the Philippines, some coming to India. And it is also now increasingly uh, underground, shall we say, although trade not underground, but you know what I mean, not very much on, uh, in the official radar of the trade statistics. Um, the other crisis we are facing, uh, many crises, but the health crisis, one, we just experienced a pandemic. Public memory is very short. Everyone certainly here seems to have forgotten, in Delhi seems to have forgotten all about it, but pretty much everywhere people have put it away as a bad memory, saying, okay, we went through that, it's not going to happen again. We know that, in fact, it will happen again. We know that we are likely to get more and more zoonotic diseases, that they will spread very rapidly, and that our global systems are completely unequipped to deal with global health issues, even though now all health will increasingly be global. There is a silent pandemic going on right now, antimicrobial resistance, uh, which we tend to take for granted in India because we're the global leaders in this, in antimicrobial resistance. We have the highest rate of it apparently in the world. And uh, that really means, that's terrifying because it means a whole range of antibiotics are not going to be 
uh, useful at all probably are already not very useful, which means even when you have an operation, post-operative treatments are no longer uh, acceptable in the same ways. But it's not something that private investment is interested in because it, you can't get sustained profits out of it. They're much more interested in future pandemics where you can have vaccines and boosters and you know, all of that stuff. So they're not really interested in doing either the research or drug development uh, that um, is required. And I know this for a fact because in the WHO they've been trying for some time, I'm, I'm, I'm on their economics council, uh, they've been trying for some time to get private players uh, involved in research development and uh, pr uh, production of newer antibiotics that would actually confront this. And the current system, frankly, is not pos it's not possible to do, no matter what kinds of subsidies you try and provide up front. Again, it's capitalism, right? It's not poly crisis in that way. Uh, the other crisis we're facing is one which we're not experiencing so directly right now in India, but there is a global debt crisis uh, which is going to, which is already manifest in many countries and it's going to get much, much worse. Now, the IMF has indicated a few months ago that 58 countries were in debt stress, which means at any moment you could get into default. There are six countries in actual default. They are unable to pay their debt servicing obligations. There are, if you look at the matter differently in terms of other calculations, around 72 to 78 countries were facing severe debt stress. Now, that doesn't mean the countries who are all paying more in debt service than they are for, let's say, health or basic good needs and so on. Those countries are many more in number. Debt servicing is now one of the largest elements of public budgets across the world. And what makes it really complicated is that this debt is not just to some governments. It's not to G7 or China. It is, of course, there is bilateral debt, mainly China, because China was the major bilateral lender over the past decade. But in fact, most of the debt now is in private hands and particularly in private bond markets. Okay? Now, private bond markets are this weird thing where anybody can buy a bond and then sell it on. And so it's almost impossible to know who the final beneficial owners are. It's very, very difficult to track the ownership of bond markets, and it means it's even harder then to track or to, to manage the debt, to come to some kind of debt resolution. Again, this is something that it's capitalism. It's the way it's evolved. It's the way in which developing countries who were suddenly called emerging markets, frontier markets, right? We were all made to feel really important and do everything we can to attract foreign capital. This was the mantra of the 90s and 2000s, right? Attract foreign capital, and then you will get money for investment, and you will be able to export, and you will develop, etc. This is the fallout of that. All the emerging and frontier markets were encouraged to borrow, and of course, you're always paying higher interest rates than the developed countries, and then when there's a crisis, you're the ones who are immediately under threat. Uh, or even when there is not necessarily a crisis in your own country, but the US decides to raise interest rates which is what happened. And uh, there is an f a flight out from your country. Your bonds get sold in the market and crash in value, like Adani bonds, but for a different reason. But basically, we are facing, we are in a situation now where many, many more countries are involved in debt crisis, for which the resolution is very complicated and difficult. And because it's so complicated and difficult, the people who should be dealing with this, the institutions that were there to address these problems, like the IMF, are sort of, you know, basically meandering along, not really doing anything, talking about it and wringing their hands and saying this is so terrible, I mean, but not really doing what is required in terms of adequate debt resolution. And this means what? It means that governments don't have money because they're paying debt service. And uh, domestically, that turns into further reduction of public services. Uh, and of course, if you then have to enter into IMF agreements with the associate conditionalities, charging more for essential services. Right now, the IMF in Pakistan is demanding that they stop free electricity to the very poor, uh, who are already reeling under 46% increase in food prices, by the way. But you have to charge them now for electricity. Uh, according to the IMF, and, and so on. So it's, um, 
The, the debt crisis is another aspect, which is again a reflection of global capitalism and a reflection of the way in which it has en been encouraged to evolve over the last two decades, three decades. Then there's the food and fuel price crisis, which has translated uh, into cost of living crisis. Okay? That's the common popular term in certainly in the north, they're all talking about how cost of living has gone up so much. In most developing countries, it's a cost of life crisis, actually. You know, you're talking about people at the margin of subsistence who are suddenly having to pay huge amounts more for food and fuel, which are basic parts of living. You cannot avoid these expenses. And of course, fuel prices enter into all other prices, right? So that, too, is something that leads to a wider inflation. In most parts of the world, money wages in, um, for the average worker, by average I mean the median worker, you know, half of the workers get less than that, have not gone up since the pandemic. And in other words, they're still around or below the level of the pandemic. In India, it's even worse. In India, our money wages are well below. The median money wage is well below the pre-pandemic level. And uh, the real wage is below the pre-demonetization level. Remember, we've had a lot of things happening to the Indian working class and peasantry, right? So it's still below 2016. That's this, the real wage for more than half of the workers. That's the condition in India. Food and fuel prices. Now, we are always told that this is a global thing. What can we do and so on? Why is it a global thing? Is it because of the war? So here is the other aspect of capitalism. It's not because of the war. Yes, of course, the war was terrible. The war was unjustified. The war led to significant disruptions in Europe. It did not lead to any change in global supply of wheat or oil. OK, can I repeat that? No change in global supply of wheat or oil. No change, which means there should not have been any price increase. How did we get a price increase? We got it because, first of all, there was profiteering by agribusiness and fuel companies. They have had the largest profits ever recorded. No major agribusiness is getting less than 20 billion, 30 billion, 40 billion increase in prices, billion dollars, OK? Fuel companies also, historically, the highest profits ever. They simply raised their prices on the assumption that everyone would say, oh, yes, of course, Ukraine war, naturally, right? And then you had financial speculation in the commodities markets, which should have been banned and supposed to have been disallowed by financial regulation after the global financial crisis. But it wasn't because, in fact, they changed the, the official rule says, yeah, I shouldn't allow it. But then there's all that small print, which effectively allows it. So you had massive financial speculation in the commodities market on the same expectation. Prices shot up to double their level from December uh, 2022 to uh, about July 2023, okay? No, sorry, the other way around, 2021 to 2022, last year, okay? They shot up like mad till July. Um, on the back of financial actors, in the Paris Exchange, for example, for wheat, okay? 72% of the long contracts where you're, you're bidding on the price going up were taken by only financial players only financial players. Wh what is a financial agent going to do with wheat, right? They're not interested in wheat. They're interested in a speculative asset class. So it goes up like mad till July and then comes down again. Global prices of both food and fuel are now below the Ukraine war, pre-Ukraine war levels, okay? But you got that massive price increase and then back to where you were, essentially because we've allowed it. We have not made regulation prevent that kind of speculative activity globally. And then, of course, countries like India, the price goes up, but it doesn't come down again. Because then the government taxes the fuel and the rupee depreciates. So anyway, imported costs go up. And this is true in many other countries, that their currency depreciation during the period of the price increase means that, it, um, that they actually face higher import prices, even when the global price is down. Final crisis, oh God, I'm gone, going on for too long, two minutes. Final crisis, on top of all of this, as if things weren't bad enough already, we have a G7 that has made itself very clearly the leader of themselves, not of even the free world, as they like to call it. 
because they're all their policies, trade policies, industrial policies, intellectual property policies, etc., are all directed to their own interests. In particular, the macroeconomic policies have had a huge role. After the global financial crisis, they went in for the biggest monetary expansion in the history of capitalism. Okay, Massive increases in what we call liquidity, money supply, and very, very low interest rates. In the US, it was at 1.0.06%, the base rate. Okay, In some countries, Sweden, Japan, negative interest rates. So very easy money sloshing around the world, looking for places to invest. That's why we are all discovered, right? Emerging markets, frontier markets. That's why the money comes sloshing in. Then they suddenly decide to raise interest rates. I mean, they were too low. There's no doubt about it. But they raise it in the most rapid interest rate increases again in history. Okay, so you're going from 0.06 to 5.6% in a year, actually nine months. Dramatic increases. What does that mean? It means all that money that was sloshing around the world rushes back to the US, capital flight, <coughs> reductions in uh, access to capital, tighter interest rates in the debt markets, bond prices falling, currency is depreciating. So that's the other thing that developing countries are facing. All of this reflects, obviously, a huge failure of global governance. And the multilateral institutions have completely failed in all this. I was going to talk about it, but I've gone on for too long. So let me finish here. And we can come back when there are more questions. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, uh, Joyti, so may I just may, uh, request you to just say a few words about what you think is happening to multilateralism okay. in the UN General Assembly? Because that has been quite a controversial issue since the United States Food Summit and the strategic partnership between the World Economic Forum yeah. and the United Nations. So, um, you know, how shall I put it? One step uh, forward, seven steps back, a couple of steps sideways is how multilateralism is going. I think we have to recognize the UN has very little power. Um, however, it's unfortunately the problems we face are global, so we do not have solutions other than global solutions. That's the problem. How is the current state of multilateralism equipped to deal with it? I would argue it's not. Uh, both the in international financial institutions, the IMF, World Bank, and others, they're not fit for purpose. They were made in a very different era. They are governed in a way that gives disproportionate power to G7 in particular. They have very little legitimacy. They're very slow to respond. I mentioned the debt crisis, but in general, they're very, very slow to respond, even using their own instruments. And they are far too driven by the immediate uh, requirements of uh, the, um, the US in particular. Uh, Abhijit will tell you much more about the WTO, so I won't go there. But there, it's not that there are no signs of hope. Um, first, I think, is the fact that the tax discussion, the global tax discussion, which had been taken over by the OECD, and international taxation is again one of those things. It was, it's a, um, a system that was developed in the early 19th century, a century ago, right? I mean, complete, two centuries ago, completely unfit for purpose. And it really needs a revamp, but the OECD took it over and accepted the principles of revamp, but then distorted it to make it effectively useless for developing countries. It has now, the General Assembly has agreed to take it up and in December, there was a vote which said we will move towards a UN tax convention, which I think is a very positive sign if it does do that and will take into account the, the real concerns of developing countries. So I think there's some hope there. There's some hope in new regionalisms. Latin America, we are seeing another wave. I don't want to call it pink revolution because that one was too short-lived. But there's some good guys now in Latin America, and they can actually um, work together. And they are showing every intention of working together. And I think that can play a positive role. The African Union came out of the COVID pandemic recognizing that they actually have to do much more regional activities. So in terms of technology hub, in terms of um, creating new uh, institutions for industrial trade within these sectors and joint investment again for dealing with climate change, Again, the African Union, I think, is emerging as a stronger regional entity. I'm hoping that, that those different pushes will actually push the multilateral system also to respond. Let's see. Yeah, thanks. Thank